Howdy everyone, this is Preston or Atomic Wolf, and I wanted to put out this bonus episode as I'm seeing the number of listeners grow on this podcast, and uh, some of you may be familiar with me, you may have heard my YouTube channel, or you followed my Instagram and came over, like migrated over here, but I have a feeling a lot more people are just discovering this series and wanting to know what this is all about, and and maybe just the story behind it, or the inspiration, or, or something of the like, and I just wanted you guys to know that uh, I really appreciate it, and I also wanted to just tell you in this little bonus episode what True Vault Escapades, The Strip, and Walter and Bunny are all about, where it came from. It's actually a pretty wacky, interesting story that I'm sure a lot of you guys would like, so I know, uh, I'm sure a majority of you are Fallout fans like me, or come from the gaming world, and if you don't, that's okay, this story is going to just cover it all, you don't need to be a fan to understand this. If you just came across this series and you don't know what Fallout is, I'm pretty sure you can still enjoy it, so I, I just wanted to, you know, get this story across, let you guys know, like, who I am a little bit, and what this, this series came from. But in short, it's because I fell so much in love with this series that Bethesda has put out that that I've loved since my childhood, basically. And I have this weird tendency, if I'm like playing or enjoying something to a point where I, I just love it so much, that I feel like I should just contribute to it in one way or another. And so, push came to shove, I somehow came up with this idea to make a 1940s inspired radio audio drama whatever you'd like to call it based within the fallout universe but this also isn't because of just fallout it's also because of the world that fallout introduced me to so to those of you who don't really know any sort of backstory about me or this radio show all of this it's it's a really weird, rocky foundation it started on, and I can't really pinpoint all of the different things that happened at different points because it was such a weird thing. It was such a weird thing to get started with because True Vault Escapade started off as an idea shortly after I finalized and created A-Bomb Radio, which at the time was called Radio Wasteland, and it was just this little ragtag, not-so-professional, old-time radio internet station I created because I just love Fallout music so much, and there was a time when Instagram was my only sole place I ever went to for any sort of opinion or posted anything at all. Instagram was such a different environment in the Fallout community at that time. This was between 2011 and 2015 so any time before fallout 4 came out the fallout community on instagram was super tight-knit and i got to meet a lot of people a lot of the big players and a lot of the smaller players and i joined i believe in july june or july of 2013 and i'm still there and it's it's crazy to imagine how long i've been there I'm not very active there anymore i still try to keep connections with people um but yeah, the fact of the matter is, I really loved the music and just the old-time vibe that Fallout, Bioshock, Mafia, uh, L.A. Noir, and games like that really introduced to me back when those games were new, and they just stuck with me. And that was the that went from the music to the cars to the architecture to the clothes, like everything. I was like, why am I so enamored by this? And I distinctly remember Fallout 3's Galaxy News Radio just, just <laughs> capturing me at the time. And and I was really, really, uh, I really don't know how to explain it. Just, just captured by it. I'm like, this music, it sounds so old and crackly and kind of creepy sometimes. But there's just something kind of magical about it. You know, it's, it's super old. It's all up to your imagination, just how old this stuff is. And I was much younger at the time. And so I just found myself listening to the Fallout 3 soundtrack and New Vegas soundtrack at the time, all the time. And I was like, I've got to do something about this. I've got to get some sort of playlist, something together to 
introduce this to the rest of the world, I guess. Just a hub for Fallout music and music like it. So, I just remember searching online where the hell I can start a a uh, online free radio service something. And I know there's all these licensing things on my mind. Like, is this even possible? There's no way this is possible. And... I find one service, which I won't name, it ended up being terrible, but it was basically the only go-to place at the time if you wanted to get some MP3s together and put them on rotation for the internet, Um, and that's what I did. I compiled this playlist together, uh, found that, Halloween music, Christmas music, and it was all vintage. I was learning so much about these artists like Billie Holiday, The Ink Spots, Benny Goodman, and Kay Kaiser, and all of these unheard of people too, like these rare uh, artists of the time, and I still have them on my PC today and still play them. And so I'm just learning all this stuff along the way, and I make it live one day. I announced it on my Instagram, I think in around 2014, and it was such so well-received. I just remember so many people listening to it at the time. I really don't think it crossed over 100 listeners at a time. And to be honest, it still doesn't, and not at one time. Um, But I had that going for me, and it had its own little app that came with it, and it was such an easy process, and uh, I I just ran uh, Radio Wasteland at the time, and that's what it was. It's just Radio Wasteland. I didn't have any jingles, anything to really identify it as my own I just had music on a loop playing all day long 24 7 and so skipping a little ahead I've, I've been having this idea in my mind like okay Fallout 3 has Herbert Daring Dashwood and his stalwart ghoul companion um what was his name Argyle <laughs> if you remember that uh in Fallout 3 you know if you listen to Galaxy News Radio every once in a while they break in with this Herbert Daring Dashwood show and I was so I was so enamored by that too. I really don't know what it was. It, it feels like an age or, or two ago. And I liked that. And I also liked how in LA Noir they would ever once in a while play a radio show on the, in the car radio. And they were real radio shows from the forties. And then I started finding my own. I started looking up my own radio shows just to see uh, what they were like, how they formatted them, what the script sounded like, and the first one that popped up was this one called Nick Carter, Master Detective, and boy, does it have a history on it. There's a pretty clear, I think it was a 1944 episode called Death After Dark. It's like this Halloween episode that Nick Carter had, and it, it, and it's still on YouTube. You can find it pretty easily. I mean, it just has this awesome a badass cover of Nick pointing his revolver at the screen and really cool lettering and stuff like that. And I'm just listening to this whole mystery and I'm like, gosh, this is so old, but this is so awesome. And I just, I just developed this uh, mass appreciation for just all things old world all of a sudden. And I'm just thinking to myself, okay, I have the station, but what about radio shows? I love, I love making narrative content. And I, or I just love the thought of making narrative content. And uh, I've, I've written a few Fallout fan fictions before, and I don't even want to get into that because it's honestly, it's so embarrassing to even think about because I was so young, the grammar and spelling was off. The story's solid, I will say that to this day. Um, but yeah, I, that's all I could ever do was write something and put it out because I don't know how you make movies, films, audio shows, things like that. So I thought, like, why not just take a fan fiction to the next level and actually make some sort of audio-based content of it? So that's when I remember I would ponder on it. I'd be like, you know what, maybe one of these days I'll make a Fallout radio show. And at this point, I was in, oh boy, I want to say this was junior year high school, maybe? And I'll never forget, it was a health class I was in that I should have been placed in freshman year, but there was some sort of system mishap, so they put me and a couple other juniors or seniors in a freshman level health class, which was a weird contrast, and I remember in that time, I wasn't talking to anybody, um, 
I don't know anybody really. And so I just have my phone out before class and I'm listening to this 40 station, another internet 40 station that wasn't mine. And I hear this song play and I'm just like, I don't know what it did to me, but it just clicked. It was Charlie Spivak. I believe it's Spivak. I don't know if it's Spivak, but in my, I'm just going to say Charlie Spivak and his orchestra. Um, Let Me Love You Tonight. It was a brief pop song in the 1940s, 1944, to be specific. And I was like, what is it with this song? It sounds really good, really dramatic, and it's just a lot. And so I screenshot it on my phone in the middle of class. And later that day, I go to YouTube and I find the video of the actual record playing. And I'm like, I've got to use this for an intro for a Fallout radio show. And it just kept on clicking throughout the night. And I'm like, this thing, it's got to be called True Something. And I just kept on just thinking and thinking and thinking. And I was pacing around the room and I was writing down ideas. And I remember True Police Stories. If you guys are Fallout fans out there, I'm sure a lot of you are. True Police Stories is a skill magazine in Fallout New Vegas. And it has a pretty noir looking detective cop on the front of it with a gun. And I'm like, I'm going to base it off of True Police Stories, but it's going to be called True Vault Escapades. It's going to be about a detective and his girl Friday. And they're going to these vaults around the wasteland in America and discovering what happened to them and solving the mysteries. And so that's when I just start doing it. I'm like, okay, True Vault Escapades, right. And the detective is going to be... Walter but what's his last name and so I'm thinking of these last names and I, I know I could have thought of something that sounded like 10 times more badass but uh I ended up thinking of I believe it was a Call of Duty character and I believe he was his name was Kamrov do you remember that I think his name was Kamrov and he was a uh some sort of like Russian sniper soldier or something from the first Call of Duty Modern Warfare Call of Duty 4 and I, I believe his name was Kamrov or Camry. And so I just named him Walter Camry. And I just was like, it rolls off the tongue. So I named him Walter Camry. And I'm thinking of the girl. And I already had her image in my mind. She was going to look like Marilyn Monroe. She was going to have like this luscious blonde hair and a, and a beauty mark on her face. And she would have eyeshadow and lipstick and the whole thing. But she was going to be this really sultry vault girl. And... I was thinking she's not going to have a name name. She's just going to have a name, just one single name. And I think I got that inspiration from some sort of like early sound movie on TCM one day. And I swear to God, I swear this, this girl's name was Kitty that this, that the lead was talking to. She was like this, she kind of looked like Jean Harlow and she, I think her name in the movie was Kitty but I'm probably making that up. I probably thought I heard that. So I'm thinking it could be Walter and Kitty. And I'm like, no, 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 that's just weird. And I later come down with the name Bunny. Huh, Walter and Bunny. That's not, that's not bad at all. And Bunny is such a, it's, I don't know, something about that name's kind of cool. And so I'm, I'm already down with the name and the names of the characters now. How is this going to kick off? How is this going to start? What is going to happen here? And I start just brainstorming. I think I was in the shower that night after I came down. I came up with those uh, foundations. And I'm in the shower just thinking about what the story is going to be. And so I'm thinking in my mind, how about instead of just them going to every vault in Fallout history, how about they are in one of the most significant vaults and they solve a mystery in there? And that's what the series is about. And it's going to be Vault 101. And I remember, I was thinking of them. I'm like, okay, it's Vault 101. It's not supposed to open or close, if you're familiar with Fallout 3. And uh, the, the, the mystery is going to be that there is some sort of, I don't know what it is. It, it's going to take place 100 years before Fallout 3. So it's going to be a whole different kind of vault in there i mean it's closed they're safe in there but there's some sort of espionage or some sort of deception going on in there that requires the help of a detective so in my mind i remember picturing this scene between 
Walter and Bunny, and Bunny, I mean, she's not even in a vault suit. She's wearing, like, this nightgown from the 30s with that white uh, fur scarf over her shoulders, and she's just dolled up to the nines, and she's just, like, holding Walter in this very old-fashioned way, and they're having that little cheesy old-time talk romance, you know? And I'm thinking, yes, okay, I'm getting this picture in my mind. So let's say since no one can enter or leave Vault 101, let's say there's some sort of thing going on in there and it's threatening the entire future of the vault and Bunny reaches out to Walter somehow with a radio or some sort of device to contact the outside and Walter somehow shimmies his way in and finds himself in this predicament and and helps Bunny and Bunny helps him try to uncover what this mystery in Vault 101 is. But I spent the night thinking about that, and I was like, you know, there's really not much I can do in there because we know what happens in Vault 101, and what the heck so significant could happen in there 100 years before Fallout 3. So I scrapped the idea, but I keep the characters uh, basically the same. Walter is this hard-up case man, and he he, uh, is real gritty and he, he dresses nice like an old detective, but he's just this, like, really violent, kind of dirty cop, and uh, he's really, he believes in swift justice, and here's Bunny, she's real soft, and she believes in, like, the the value and life everywhere, and, you know, she she's not very much like Walter is. But now I have to move them, because I don't really know where they're gonna be if it's not Vault 101, and all the other vaults don't seem as significant to have a um, mystery like this in it. So I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to make up my own story. It's going to be away from any known Fallout narrative. It's not going to be around any type of game. Not yet. <laughs> and it's going to just be their own story. So I'm not leeching off of an already created one. So, of course, me being from Texas, I moved them down to Texas, and I don't really know where exactly this takes place, but I have them somewhere in West Texas, where there's a little bit more country, and there's a lot of space to work with, and so I decided to instead have this story take place over there, but Walter's and, Walter and Bunny sort of have a cleaned up version of of themselves than what I just mentioned before, their personalities. I mean, they're kind of the same, but they're not as uh, dramatic. So anyway, I look up known towns in Texas. So I actually did have a place. So scratch that. Carbon. There's a place in Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, probably the weirdest, most non-Fallout game out there. I never even played it. I actually went on Wikipedia or uh, Fallout Nukipedia and was looking up any known places in Texas for this to take place. So they did mention Carbon, I believe it was the starting town in Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to use this place. It's supposed to be some sort of small town, kind of cow town place. And I uh, had Walter placed in there, just disregarded everything else because Fallout Brotherhood of Steel isn't officially canon from what I remember. It's just sort of like up in the air uh, with modern Bethesda's lore. And I have Walter, this this detective who's actually, in this case, not dirty. He believes in justice. He is hardened by the wasteland, but he cares. And he really does care about justice. And his, his father, his uh, family, somebody at this, in his childhood trained him in deduction and detective work and what's right and what's wrong as opposed to most of the wasteland people and he uses this ability to make a career for it for himself and he becomes this private detective sort of like nick valentine in fallout 4 uh, except he works alone so it starts out in this case with walter in this town of carbon he makes this sort of enterprise for himself a very small one but he has his own house he has his own office and business is doing okay and then one day it's implied that Walter took a job that he would not recover from and he would not solve the mayor who's not mentioned of carbon is this crooked 
crooked guy and he's screwing over so many of the townsfolk and it's kind of like a mob rule sort of thing and Walter is investigating it from and Walter is investigating it on his own time and tries to expose these corrupt officials and it just completely backfires on him he gets identified caught whatever and his house gets evicted all of a sudden his reputation is slandered nobody comes to him anymore and now he's literally living inside of his office in his broom closet he mentions in the first episode of true bald escapades and it seems as if he's given up hope and he's and i actually based this whole image off of the first episode of burial at sea from bioshock infinite's dlc uh where booker dewitt is just sitting on his counter and he's just like like half asleep on his table and then all of a sudden elizabeth comes in and just wakes him up and he's like we're closed and and that whole debacle happens and so that's I, that was actually a scene that inspired the opening scene of true wild escapades walter is in his office slumped over his table and in comes bunny this sultry vault girl who looks so different from everyone else uh, just offers him a job out of nowhere and that's where the story takes off and i'll get to that in a second but i do want to talk about just sort of behind the scenes what's going like what went on in making this whole thing but um yeah that is the thing that transpires walter down his luck detective losing his money losing his house losing his job about to move about to just make a whole new start for himself with no money um gets approached by a vault girl who offers him a ton of money and basically it's an offer he can't refuse but um backing up a bit in just the production side of this um at this point in the station and what i was doing with uh radio wasteland at the time radio wasteland i mentioned previously that it ended up being terrible with that uh server website service i was using to run it because you had to have a certain amount of listeners per month in order to keep your station going. That was the price you had to pay for having a free internet service uh, all around. You had to have a certain amount, a threshold of listeners every month, or they just spontaneously take down your station. And I was meeting those numbers for months and months on end. One month I must have just got lazy, or I just didn't even look at it. I just forgot. I was like, you know what, I'm not going to have to worry about this. I distinctly remember this day. I was driving my brother to school, my little brother to school, and the moment I dropped him off and he left and he closed the door, I was checking my phone that morning and I got an email from this service and it said, very sorry, but we have to take down Radio Wasteland. And I was so just, I mean, I can't tell you, it was weird, it's a weird thing to imagine being so upset over something so little but I really did care about it so I just remember shaking almost like I was so disgusted by it there were listeners coming in like what the heck is going on here what happened to the station this the feed is cut off what's going on and I remember driving home faster than I should in my little Honda Civic my first car (laughs) and I um I, I remember rushing home I got my laptop out and I opened it and was just freaking out, spazzing out on the keyboard, trying to figure out what went wrong. And I had to come to terms with they removed every last bit of my station, files, descriptions, info, everything. Like I couldn't salvage it and use it for later. They literally just wiped the whole station from total existence. So I was just heartbroken. And I remember putting out a thing on Instagram, which, again, was my only outlet at the time saying like yeah this is real sad but i gotta keep this going like i'm gonna try it again on the same service and do my best to keep the numbers up each month so let's find a name and let's that's not radio wasteland because that was part of the rule you can't come back with the station and name it the same as your previously closed station so uh people started flooding in in the comments i had a pretty significant following at the time and It was a lot of good names. One guy came up with a name called Old World Tunes. And I was like, huh, I like that. So, because, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Fallout New Vegas Old World Blues. And it's going to 
sort of rings similar when they think of my station or vice versa uh old world tunes because that's what it is it's old world music so i quickly get all the files i had left in in my pc and i uploaded them made a new logo got some artists to make some free stuff for me and uh rebranded the station as old world tunes so um i don't know if i cut that out yet in this podcast um because it's been a while since i've listened to them but you may hear old world tunes mentioned in the first couple episodes or the first handful of episodes of true vault escapades or maybe even the episodes that follow uh you may hear the narrator say brought to you by old world tunes well of course that's not the name anymore uh it changed a, a second time so yeah, if you hear that and are kind of confused because the current episodes are sponsored or brought to you by A-Bomb Radio, rather, that's the reason. It changed a second time, and I'll get to that as well. Um, but it survived as old world tunes from, like, 2014 to 20, um, I want to say 17. So it stayed there for a couple of years as old world tunes, and I was still trying to create uh, the radio show, The True Vault Escapade. So... Now that's out of the way, the casting process in my early days of putting this show together was, it was, it was a pain. I, that's all I'm going to say. It was a pain and I thought it was going to be so much easier. I had tens of thousands of followers on Instagram, on my Fallout uh, Instagram page at the time. And uh, I was thinking, you know, if I just put out a casting call here, I'm going to have enough people reach out to me and say they want to voice Walter or Bunny or these characters, um, and they're going to, it's going to be easy. It's going to be so easy because I have so many people following me. There's no way none of these people are going to miss the mark. Someone's going to hit the mark. So I remember putting out a thing saying like, hey, I'm looking for this Nick Carter old time radio inspired cast and people who can sort of make these transatlantic accents sort of sound old and 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 kind of retro modern just and sort of deliver that vibe to this show and I'm going to make it sound like it's from the 1940s but it's going to be in fallout at the same time so it's going to be really cool and so I have all these people reach out to me so many and just as I expected <laughs> I did not know the age range of my followers at the time. A lot of them were in their teens. I was not expecting that. I was expecting people to be, I guess I was in maybe my late teens at the time. I want to say maybe late teens because uh, I was still in high school. Um, oh my gosh. I had all of these people that sounded like Xbox PlayStation squeakers talking through their Xbox PlayStation microphones trying to audition with these lines not reading anything i put in the description like no i'm literally looking for humphrey bogart here i'm looking for Cary grant i'm looking for somebody that sounds like an old smoky voiced hollywood movie star to voice walter and i'm looking for someone that sounds like awesome and sultry at the same time like marilyn or or barbara stanwick or uh, lauren bacall everybody just disregarded that or they just didn't read it and <laughs> I I still have I'm telling you I knew I would save this one day for something and it, it and I saved some of these audition files I deleted a lot of them a long time ago because they were they were just too much it was so overwhelming to listen to it's so cringy I mean just imagine someone that sounds like they're four years old trying to read these kind of highly I won't say sophisticated, but for those people, it, it's probably a little too sophisticated for them. The things I was writing and the way I wanted them said, it was just so funny. I even had people I knew who I corresponded with a lot <laughs> try to audition for it. They sounded terrible. I'm sorry, but they sounded terrible. Um, and, and it all sounded like SoundCloud quality, like just really like no pop filter Sounded like it wasn't even a USB mic. It was like a little webcam mic. It was terrible. And uh, I believe the first person I got on board was Amy Harris, who was a follower of mine, who played Bunny. 
I don't know. And here's the thing. I really don't know much about my cast even today. I, I talk to them. We shout each other out every once in a while. Um, at the time, I was just like, I need a voice. I really don't care about anything else. I need someone to make this vision come true. And so Amy Harris, she hit the mark closer than anybody. So if you listen to her um, on the earlier episodes, imagine that out of a sea of just just awfulness. So she was a shining light uh, for, for this because I was starting to lose hope. <laughs> But I remember I was putting out this on Instagram and everywhere else I could. And most people were like, yes, make this. This is such an original idea. So Amy got her. Great. And then I don't even remember how I met Eric. Um, Eric Huffman, who was and currently is, he's been Walter the entire way through. He came in somewhere email dm i don't remember how he reached out to me but i heard it and i was like whoa i need this guy <laughs> i just need it you know he sounds he when he does his voice like that he sounds like uh humphrey bogart and i'm like there's no one else that's gonna top this not at this time so i got eric to do um humphreys i'm sorry i got eric huffman to do walter and the rest came into play. Um, at that time, I got a friend of mine who was also a fellow creator. Um, he's Australian. If you listen to the first True Vault Escapade, the first five episodes, you know Officer O'Neill. He's this uh, Australian uh, security officer in Vault 54. And then there's Officer Jensen. Um, he was voiced by um, Josh... Oh my gosh, I can't even think of his name. I just know his name was Josh. And I found him through uh, Fallout lore. So, you know, there is a there is a little connection between True Vault Escapades and the Fallout lore series that was pretty popular for a time on the ShoddyCast YouTube channel. They made this series. It was like machinima animated. It was like they would talk about the lore, the deep lore of Fallout. And there was this narrator named the Storyteller who also came on board. And there was a character towards the end of the series. I believe he was a clone of the Vault Dweller. I forgot. I forgot where that story went. But I remember the Storyteller, this NCR Ranger, the an iRobot, and and this old man were trying to hunt down somebody and it ended up being like a clone of the vault dweller or the chosen one so the voice of that vault dweller is officer jensen who's the another another security guard in the true vault escapade series and then i reached out to shoddy cast and i was like hey shoddy cast whoever you are i really want the storyteller as well to be a part of this series I'm putting together is there a way you can have me reach out to him and they said yes absolutely so they give me his info I reach out to him he really liked the idea and uh he was the voice of Vault 54's overseer overseer Mackenzie so if you didn't know that and you follow Fallout lore or just Fallout stuff in general and you know about Fallout lore yeah, know that there's two members of Fallout lore, the clone and also the storyteller himself. He is the overseer uh, in Bunny's vault. And I had a bunch of these little side characters come in. Uh, it wasn't that big of a cast, really. The story seemed so big that the cast seemed big, but it wasn't. Um, so yes, that was set in stone. I remember there was just a lot of uh, back and forth between me and some actors who were in there most of them supporting a lot of them forgot about their scripts and they would the, the show would delay a couple times I really don't remember who um, I'm sure I was not handling this properly as well and uh, we had the cast and that was great we had the script I actually remember I was still finishing up the script by the time they were recording the first few episodes but we got it going, I was typing it up on my computer, and I was really excited. And here's the thing, I was really young, I don't know, I didn't know anything about, like, MP3s and WAV files and 
how you edit them and mixing and sound effects and audio levels. I didn't know anything about that. I was just going to make this pilot or whatever you want to call it and put it out there. So skipping to the part where I get all the files I need and all the sound effects I can download, <laughs> I, I go on Sony Vegas. I go on a bootleg Sony Vegas 13 and I start making the episode, you know, putting chopping out the files and choosing the takes I wanted and putting them all in this one project and putting the files on top of one another. So, you know, if Walter talks and I use that little portion where he speaks in the script and then I cut off the rest, slide it to the side for later, and then I get Bunny if she responds and I put it right next to his and I make sure it's all leveled out nice so it kind of flows better, you know, like the the uh, timing of the dialogue. So, and I still continue to do that today, even though I use uh, editors now, thank God. <laughs> um, yeah, but I ended up putting out these episodes one by one as the weeks went by, and I was so excited to hear them. I was like, everyone's going to love to hear this, and I only put it out on YouTube. I only put it out on YouTube because that was the only place I knew where I could put these things out there. I didn't really consider podcasts at the time. I thought you needed some of the most gee whiz technical know-how to actually get into podcasting. I thought you needed coding, or if you didn't want to do it yourself, you needed to get a team, sign some contracts, pay some money. I didn't know anything about this, and I still don't. That's why I'm using a free service right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, uh, I I put it out on YouTube. People were loving it. It wasn't really rising that much. I was honestly disappointed that when I was putting the advertisements for it out on Instagram, my most followed area, trying to, you know, plug it, not many people were giving it the time of day as they were when I was teasing it. So I thought that was really weird. And uh, I, I was just a little disappointed in that, but I had to just, you know, not set my expectations so high because this is new it's going to be hit or miss or somewhere in between. I don't know. So I just kept on releasing the episodes as they went and there they were. And boy, I mean, they, they incubated there and that's why most of the first five episodes on YouTube are at least up a thousand views and the other ones following it are still in the, either the early thousands as well or in the hundreds still. I don't know, but YouTube really isn't the place for that. And that's kind of what I'm just now realizing with podcasting. This is people want to kind of move around and do things while they listen to these things. You, they, they they don't want the burden of keeping a tab open with this running on YouTube. They want to take this with them. They want to play it in the car. They want to do it while they clean. They want to do it while they study. You know, it's better to have it portable. And I think that was the issue. And I just kept myself up at night sometimes, just like, why isn't this going anywhere? I know people want to hear this. But yeah, going over the synopsis, we have a finalized story. Walter is down on his luck. Bunny comes in, says, I'll give you 10,000 caps if you can help solve my Balt's problem, because we need someone on the outside who has no bias, because that's basically where the problem is circulating, is bias, and we need someone with outside eyes to look into this and see what's going on here. So, of course, Walter is, I don't know why I made him like this, but as you can see, Walter doesn't know a thing about vaults and vault tech and just what happened before the war, but I think I wanted to do that at the time for folks who weren't familiar with Fallout to just sort of get an education of it so they know this this story, where, where this comes from. So Walter's kind of educating the listener who potentially may not know anything about Fallout, about Fallout. So that's why I had Walter somewhat ignorant of what happened in the vault. So Walter and Bunny go in there, and Officer O'Neill and Officer Jensen are kind of shady, and they they go and meet the overseer, and the overseer is concerned because there's some sort of there's some sort of vote happening in the vault soon that would determine if the door in the front would stay closed or open for all eternity basically and a lot of the vaults people want to leave and a lot of the vaults people want to stay they don't want to be open to the elements some want to just go out there and say we've been here too long and so the you know walters is walter and bunny are just sort of getting to know more of each other in there 
Bunny ends up being a vault officer or a vault detective uh, as well. So she connects with Walter very well. Uh, they have an audience with the overseer, and he's just so concerned. Uh, he believes that there's some sort of inner circle against him, even in his own government. And he hires Walter to just look into this. There's there's supporters dying who want to keep the vault door closed. And they even witness a murder. But Walter and Bunny witness a murder on the way to his uh, residence there. And uh, they, they, they go through this whole thing trying to discover who is conspiring against the people who want to keep the vault door closed and if so why do they want to keep it open is it all just because they want the freedom that bad or is it something more sinister and walter and bunny basically figure out there is this ring within the vault that is planning to open it not just for themselves but because uh officer jensen was contacted by the enclave who want to get into the vault of course um and, and was basically ordering Jensen to do whatever it takes by whatever means necessary to keep that vault door open by the time they arrive. Because if it's closed, there's going to be no way for them to get inside. So um, he, all, he also did this behind the overseer's back. The whole location of the vault was revealed because vault Tech planned for that message to get to Vault 54 at that particular time. It was on some sort of clock. And that was, and that was how the Enclave found out. They somehow tracked the message and found out, oh, this is this whole new vault we haven't even pried open. So that was the whole thing. And the vault goes into mass chaos, and Walter and Bunny end up solving the mystery. But by the end of it, Walter and Bunny are left with this odd position. They're like, okay, we got to keep the vault closed now because these foreign people want to get in here. We don't know what's going on. And Walter says they're terrible. And so, at the end, Walter is paid his 10,000 caps in a jar, and Bunny is at the front door of the vault. Security's trying to keep them back, and everyone's going nuts. And Walter is like, Bunny, come with me. This is whole big world out here, and you're such a great detective, and you can come with me. And Bunny's like, no, I'm not going to abandon my people just for this, even though I do want to come with you, and, you know, maybe the fates will bring us together. And that's when... Bunny gives him a long-awaited kiss and pushes him out of the vault, and Walter is 10,000 caps richer, and they go their separate ways. And that's when these two sequels, these two spin-offs I created, came afterwards, because I thought initially that True Vault Escapades was going to end with True Vault Escapades, these five episodes, and it's up to the listener to figure out what happened next. But that is not the case. I loved this way too much. A lot of people wanted to see more of this as well, so I started putting together these two spin-offs where Walter is off on his own in Plano, Texas now, a real place, Plano, Texas. It's a built-up city in Fallout in my mind, so he starts his own nicer detective agency. He becomes ingrained in society there. I'm guessing this is a few months after, and he's called to go to this cave because a caravan with his secretary included it has gone missing in this cave and a distressing distress message was released and walter goes on his own little vendetta to find them and when he's in this cave here comes this giant death claw this talking death claw that the enclave if you know fallout lore you know what i'm talking about but this big death claw named draco is there on behalf of the Enclave saying, look, I'm bringing you here because we want to get into Vault 54. We know you were there. If you want to see that caravan and your secretary safe, then you have to work with us. And a uh, funny story with that, there is a guy named uh, Draco Deathclaw on Twitter. He's pretty prominent on Twitter. He has, he has a few thousand followers last time I checked. Uh, he's, he makes Fallout memes, and I've known him for a while, so... I made him an actual character within the True Vault Escapades world, and he voiced himself. And I did this cool little trick on Audacity where you can make him sound kind of demonic. So that's why. So that's how I made him sound like that. So this would mark the first sequel, Draco. Walter meets Draco, the friendly Death Claw, 
And Walter basically agrees because he has no choice and he also has a chance to potentially meet Bunny again. So uh, it, it's kind of a win-win and Walter ends up infiltrating this Caesar's Legion camp built around an old retired military facility somewhere to retrieve this uh, component that, that is nicknamed the can opener because it can be attached to this device that the Enclave has, some sort of like this drill, this this power tool that's huge, and it can give it the extra boost it can to actually pry open Vault 54 even though it's closed. So it's it could work, it may not, and Walter takes a chance by going undercover into this Legion base where he's caught and uh, ends up working with the Centurion that's overseeing the whole camp, and he makes an effort to find it which he does he has to solve a murder as he does the centurion was uh finding that people in his camp were getting murdered in the barracks and walter uses his skills to find out who it is and he does and it's some other soldier who that night runs down into the military facility and walter chases him has a sword fight with him uh i believe if i remember he cuts off his finger and interrogates him and come to find out that this is no Caesar's soldier. This is no Caesar's legion. This is actually an undercover Brotherhood of Steel agent come for the exact same component that Walter's looking for. And so it kind of puts Walter in another tough spot because he needs it and he wants to see Bunny again. And this Brotherhood guy, he needs it for the Brotherhood for something else, and he offers Walter to work with him to fight against these Legion crazies, basically, and Walter's just like, I can't, and he ends up shooting the Brotherhood agent, Agent Kale, I believe his name was, and leaves him there dead, and in a moment of just pure selfishness, he shoots and kills this brotherhood member uh just so he doesn't get his cover blown by him and to prove his loyalty his fake loyalty to caesar's legion and when he gets the device from the centurion uh draco has already called in the cavalry for the enclave to level the military base and takes walter with him in the vertebrate to go back to Vault 54 now that he has the component. So, skipping ahead, Enclave is there at the front door trying to bust through this thing, and Draco explains to Walter on the way, like, look, I've been in contact with the overseer of Vault 54. They appointed a new one after Mackenzie was murdered, and apparently Bunny is safe. So, Walter already still reeling from that murder he committed something so against his character is uh feeling a little better knowing that at least you know there's a chance this vault could be turned upside down on the inside since he last left it but bunny could still be there and there could be a life for them together so they attach the component it works they come into the vault and walter and draco walk into the overseer's office to meet this new overseer overseer custer only to find him uh dead on the floor in his office from a self-inflicted gunshot wound and and they're freaking out they don't know what happened why he would do this and the overseer's tunnels open walter is just appalled he's like where's bunny and he goes into this large underground like basement garage where as in a regular vault an overseer's tunnel would just take you in another part of the vault but this overseer's tunnel takes you to this big storage facility underneath the vaults where all he finds all walter finds is a note and the note says that it's from bunny that he that she has escaped and she is on her way to new vegas and wants walter to join her and that is where walter meets draco the friendly death claw leaves off and where the second spinoff uh a vault in ruin starts which is basically showing from bunny's perspective what happened so it it is an interesting cliffhanger and a vault in ruin follows bunny and this is also um besides the storyteller uh who voiced overseer mckenzie and so many other characters down the line 
another guest star would make an appearance, which in this case is the uh, pretty popular YouTuber, Mr. Matty Plays, and I have quite a history with Mr. Matty Plays. I, uh, If you're a Fallout fan, I'm 90% sure you know who he is, so he... Uh, I met, I met him somewhere through Instagram. I, I don't really remember. It, it, I'm telling you, it feels like an age ago. But me and Matty uh, have talked in the past. I remember I started watching him when Fallout 4 was getting teased by all of these fake hoax accounts. If you remember the Survivor 2299 and all of these different things that were coming out. That was such an exciting time. But Mr. Matty was basically my go-to guy for that stuff so I'd always subscribe and watch his videos and he's still making videos today uh, about all other games too um and he featured as a character named Dusty which is actually a real life nickname of his um and he is the Vault 54 radio host and he comes in when the Vault in Ruin is starting off and it's basically taking place right after Bunny was left in the vault when the door closed and all chaos just took hold of everything. And it turns out that the police just could not hold back the people. This big, like, sort of civil war happened in there. People were dying and everything was just turned upside down. And Bunny was trying to figure out what happened. And uh, she goes to Dusty, Mr. Maddie Plays. Uh, and basically asks him what's going on and says that uh, Mackenzie's dead and Overseer Custer, someone who she knew within the police force and didn't like very much, has taken over and trying to keep order. And Bunny and Dusty meet up with him to go on this, go on this mission to stop this vault mafia, basically, of helping the Enclave get inside because Custer knew that the Enclave was coming and was pretty sure that they were going to come through. But he sent Dusty and Bunny to go retrieve these documents from the Vault Mafia who, are, you know, they're getting paid off by the Enclave. They're getting promised all these riches and they can have their own gang out in the wasteland, which, you know, wasn't going to come true if they had succeeded. So, um, they retrieve these documents and they bring them back to Custer only to figure out that they were blueprints to something and that's what the Enclave was in there for or was wanting to get in there for. And she asks, what are they? And so Custer says, well, um, everybody thought that our vault's experiment was about this vote to keep the door open or closed. But that's not true. The real thing that Vault 54 was hiding was an experimental project to bring back automobiles to the wasteland. And that document they retrieved was blueprints to it. And the Enclave wanted to get their hands on it so they could mass produce them and use them for their military purposes, which were pretty sinister. And... They have one experimental prototype in that basement that I mentioned before, and it's designed like a 1928 Rolls Royce, but it has like a fusion powered engine and power armor body and all of this crazy stuff in it, uh, very Fallout like. And Custer also reveals that he wants Bunny and Dusty to take the vehicle, which has a uh, there's a hatch in the vault that opens up for the vehicle to be popped out through like a secret entrance through the top uh, on the surface so uh he says the enclave knows he's there and if uh and if they know that he's still out there they're gonna be looking all over for him and uh he's basically saying go bunny and dusty go drive far away from this place so they can't find you and he burns the documents the blueprints so they can't retrieve them that's the only copy and Custer sends Bunny and Dusty on their way. Du Bunny leaves the note just from the slim chance Walter may find it. And they escape in the car and head for New Vegas. And as they do that, Custer ends up shooting himself so the Enclave can't get any information out of him. And that's why when they get there, everything's just blown to shreds. He's gone. The car is gone. There's no documents. And they have no idea where it could be, if it's even there. So... That's what happens 
with the saga of True Vault escapades. Uh, there is also something I want to add on. There is a machinima out there. If you, those of you who don't know anything about gaming world, uh, anything about this kind of stuff, uh, a machinima is just a fan film, a movie, short film, whatever you want to call it, filmed within a video game. And me, uh, me and Michael Onley, who the Australian who I mentioned earlier, I just remember his name, uh, who voiced. Officer O'Neill in the True Vault Escapade series, uh, he and I teamed up to work on this sort of bridged entry between the strip and True Vault Escapades called Deadstone, and we ended up making it. It's this really ambient machinima we made. We didn't have any ability to make the characters in Fallout 4. We shot it within Fallout 4. He did because I have no knowledge about this or any system that could handle all the things he was doing to it. So uh, I wrote it and directed it. He filmed it and we put it out there. He told me that he's, you know, he's no wizard with this, so we can only work within certain parameters. And that included not being able to do like a lot of action shots and a lot of fast moving things like some machinimas do. So we had to keep it kind of mostly dialogue and mystery and and less action so we made it tense walter it, it follows walter after the events of walter meets draco and he's now following the road to new vegas from texas so he's going west and he left texas uh left new mexico and now he's in arizona and he stops in some town in Arizona called Deadstone, which is covered by this radiation cloud. And there's these interesting cast of characters. And all Walter is planning on doing is staying at their local hotel for a night or two before he continues his journey to Nevada. But a murder plagues the town and Walter teams up with the sheriff to solve the murder. And there is this whole mystery involving this town and the local Children of Adam church, the cult, and almost anyone in the town could fit the description of the murderer because the story goes is that even though the local cult is generally peaceful, uh, the leader of it, which Walter uh, has a conversation with and is actually pretty cool, says that one of his apprentices turned kind of militant with their beliefs and started to go rogue against the church and started murdering townsfolk in the name of their deity, Adam, you know. And Walter is just trying to deduct who it is and all of these very mysterious things are happening. And by the end of it, Walter figures out who the murderer is. And I have a feeling that a majority of you who are kind of new to this series haven't seen or heard of this so i'm not going to spoil it who the murderer is um so i'm going to see if i can post this take the audio from the machinima and put it here since it's mostly dialogue um so we'll we'll see i'll, I'll definitely like to to see if if it can work here on podcast but if you haven't seen it it's on youtube it's called fallout deadstone so yeah it is actually the first and only real visual adaptation of this True Vault Escapade series, so I implore you all to see it if you haven't. I may put it here if it actually works in audio form. So, yes, Walter discovers who it is, and he moves on to Nevada. And going back into the real world here, um, so we went over it. It was Radio Wasteland, didn't meet a threshold, had to change it to Old World Tunes. So you might be wondering why... At this time, it was around the time the True Vault Escapade series ended and the strip was beginning. I changed it to A-Bomb Radio. And believe me, this is the last time I will ever change it, so it's going to stay this way. But it was called Old World Tunes for such a long time, so you might be wondering why I wanted to change it. Well, I won't mention any names of things, whatever, but there was a time when I was suggested by a listener on Facebook to reach out to this group I will say they're a group I guess that they're a group and they make mods within Fallout 4 and they specialize in radio mods 
So he tells me, you know, you should really get Old World Tunes and turn it into a mod. Because I know a lot of people would like to see this, and I would too, because, hey, uh, I don't know anything about game design, the GEC, or whatever you use to uh, make your own content within Fallout. So I reach out to them. It was a neat exchange, and we basically, I, I, I had the storyteller do his DJ lines for the station. So, you know, while you're playing Fallout 4 or whatever, you have your Pit Boy, you have uh, Diamond City Radio, the classic station, and then you could possibly have Old World Tunes there and have some of the music in my library in it. And so I work with them, and they put it there, and the storyteller is the DJ, and it, it was so neat. And they also added True Vault Escapades to it. And I wanted to be very clear with them. I said, hey, I want to make sure that I am fully credited here you are a lot more popular than i am and i just want to make sure that the proper people are credited i don't want people to take this as your creation i uh, hope you can understand that and you're like okay absolutely sure and i got a little credit in the mod description <sighs> yeah guys it was such a bad idea and i do put a lot of that blame on myself but i didn't expect it to be this bad so Everywhere I went, everywhere I went that involved one of my own creations, particularly Walter and Bunny, True Vault Escapades, people were associating it with the guys or guy who was making this mod. And that just got under my skin. It really did. I mean, imagine like just working your finger to the bone, typing this thing up and, and casting this, this awful casting process and all of this stuff. And, um... Only to have a lot of people, most people, if not all, credit someone else with your creation. And um, I was just so, I felt heartbroken seeing that. Just people like, oh, this is from that mod. Like, th th this is from that mod. And, and wow, this mod is so genius with this. And, and I'm just like, hold on, I made this. But nobody, you know, no one is going to listen <laughs> to me. So I, I contacted them and I was like, I, I hate to say this. This was a bad idea. Can we please just get my station and my radio show removed from this mod? Because too many people and an uncomfortable amount of people are crediting someone else, you, with my creation. And so it was a shock to the mod people, and I couldn't have been more sorry, but they said, hey, we can remove True Vault Escapades for you. But we're not going to remove Old World Tunes. Old World Tunes with the Storyteller, that's going to stay there. So I said, I, I was really upset by that because I knew anything I did with my Old World Tunes radio station, uh, it was going to be sort of enveloped by them because I, I kind of inadvertently gave them my radio station. Uh, the, the name, you know, because they're, I mean, they have, oh my God, they have legions of followers. I mean, that completely outshine my own and, and influence. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to rename it, do my best to separate them, start clean and be absolutely independent. Like I'm not going to give anybody my radio show. I'm not going to give anybody anything. I'm just going to make a new brand, brand all of my creations under it with this new brand so i just came up with it on my own a bomb radio a dash bomb radio still there still up it's still in the same roots as that old radio wasteland i told you about from years ago so it's still out there uh, uh please if you don't know about it it's on the apple app store it's on the google play android it's uh, it's almost like literally everywhere you can get an app and it's also more popularly on TuneIn Radio. So if you have TuneIn Radio, the TuneIn app, uh, look for it there. Or if you have Apple Music, you can look at it under the station section. It's there. You'll see the little golden circle, A-bomb radio, A-B-R on it. Um, that is my station still running, still going strong. So that is the current state of it. But that is why I changed it a second time. And it's no, I mean, I'm not here I'm not even trying to say like they're bad or anything like that. It's just that's the story. That's why I did it. I wanted a clean start with it. And uh, that's where we are now. So now that that's out of the way, the story of Walter and Bunny continued 
in this new serialized format that I wanted to just add on to it because True Vault Escapades and the three spinoffs that followed it, they all followed one specific story. And I went on later to just decide to say, hey, now that Walter and Bunny are in New Vegas, let's have them start their own joint detective agency and they're deputized by Mr. House. And instead of having them follow another long story split by different episodes, why not it just be one mystery per episode? And whenever I decided to do that, that's when I started to listen to a lot more of Nick Carter, Master Detective, the radio show that inspired Walter and Bunny. And if you listen to it, you can spot a lot of similarities in Nick Carter from the 40s and The Strip. Because I actually, for one, took the organ transitions. Anytime there'd be a transition in the scene in Nick Carter, there would be like this organ playing real just cheesy, sinister, you know, transition music. I clipped those out of Nick Carter and put those in the strip episodes, as you can hear right here on the podcast. And with the strip, I wanted to try something that hopefully changed the tone with Walter and Bunny with True Vault Escapades. I wanted it to be something a teeny bit more snappy, and, and that's something I really suck at when I write. I like to just go on these sort of tangents when I write, and I don't even know how long the script is spanning. So sometimes when I would write these episodes of the strip that were intended to be, say, 30 minutes long, they'd end up being an hour long, or even longer than that. So I would just sort of accept them as they were, because I really didn't know how to equate time with the script. Like, I don't really know how to write a script and stop it at a particular time. I just sort of guesstimated in my mind, which was completely overshot, as you can see. But, um, yes, they were all one-time mysteries. The new foundation in the strip now that they were away from Texas and their old problems with Vault 54 is that Walter and Bunny... Now in WB Investigations, a little on the outskirts of New Vegas, they have this little setup now. They have a telephone in their office, and only one telephone in the Vegas region actually connects to it. So if you have a problem, it's advertised to go to that phone and call them up. And that's where they would get their mystery sometimes, or they would just be out and about and stumble on a murder themselves. So the cases were just again it's just so similar to Nick Carter the way I did it it's almost identical because they had a new ally um first of all they brought the car with them so the car is like their signature thing besides the phone they have a car and it takes them all around the Mojave and they're just so good at it now because they get around so quick and patrol the wasteland with so much ease but um they their new ally is Lieutenant Humphreys, who started off as Sergeant Humphreys when I wrote him in, but I wanted him to be closer to Lieutenant Riley, who is from Nick Carter, Master Detective. He was the guy that was sort of this this kind of like strict by the books. He was an Irishman, and and he really didn't see beyond the box, and Nick and Patsy, his assistant, uh, would basically blow his mind with just the mysteries that they would solve with the clues that the cops and lieutenant riley would generally overlook and and so what i did was have the storyteller yet again who played um uh, uh, overseer mckenzie he was the voice of lieutenant humphreys who was this ncr lieutenant he's up there and he helps walter and bunny with the jobs they get or they'll have him tag along and he just became this ally and it was a neat little contrast because Walter and Bunny they think outside of the box Lieutenant Humphreys not so much but he's tough as nails so they keep him along and uh, another interesting aspect about the strip is that since it deals with the war going on in the Mojave this is taking place slightly before the events of Fallout New Vegas where the courier gets shot um, 
I don't like to make it out to where one side is better than the other, particularly the NCR, because even though the NCR is sort of made out to be the good guys, there's enough evidence in New Vegas that shows that even though they do have good intentions and they are better moral than the Legion, they generally stomp over people that they claim to protect and they put all these regulations and taxes on people and generally ruin people's lives so i don't like in the strip to project that false hero you know sense over the ncr there there are a lot of episodes where walter and bunny end up discovering that the culprit is ncr or the ncr has covered up something that's super sinister and they have to be really careful how they tread and um i really like how that has played out in the series so far like there are really no true heroes even though they do associate themselves with the ncr a lot of the time they never truly take their side so walter and bunny are basically like the perfect neutral faction kind of characters in the story and another little easter egg before i forget in the strip and the current walter and bunny series is the character mr casket who is by far their arch nemesis in this entire series so far because Mr. Casket in episode four, he kidnaps Bunny in their car, tries to sell her off to the Legion. Walter just rips the town apart to find her and ends up ends up defeating Casket. And then he gets out and Walter and Bunny defeat Casket a second time. And as I'm recording this, it, we're in the middle of the case of the Masked Spectre where Walter and Bunny are trying to foil Casket's plans again. And Mr. Casket is actually based off of a character I heard one brief time in one of the Nick Carter episodes where Nick and Patsy are in the middle of trying to blow the cover of some sort of corruption and they're driving in the rain one day and here comes this car and it cuts them off, pulls them to the side of the curb and out comes this old nemesis who's never mentioned in Nick Carter before. But he gets out and he realizes it's a guy named Coffin. And Coffin is like this sinister, just just evil character who's threatening Nick and Patsy on their way to their next location. And like, you better not dig any deeper. There's these big mobsters involved. And Nick is just talking to Coffin as if they've like like they've introduced him before but as far as my memory is concerned they haven't so i based mr casket off of coffin so that's where i got him from and he's this evil devious dastardly slaver who kidnaps people and sells them and has this big enterprise and he's real dapper so i've really built on that character as well who is also for the longest time voiced also by the storyteller <laughs> he did a lot of voices for me um, he's now voiced by Philip Sacramento, who is now the current narrator, and he does a lot of other supporting voices as well. So, yes, Mr. Casket is their constant returning enemy, and we'll see how that goes. But that basically brings us to present time. And uh, seriously, I mean, there, there's, I mean, there's a lot more I could go in on, like uh, the different artworks that's been given to me and the little other Easter eggs, but... Uh, that's basically just catching you up to speed and just the story about how this all got started. It all got started with this little song I heard, Charlie Spivak's uh, 1944 song, Let Me Love You Tonight, and there's a few other versions of it. Dean Martin has a version, Woody Herman's orchestra has a version, and um, it's just so weird because, you know, you listen to the first five episodes of True Bald Escapades, that's the theme song I'm using, so whenever you hear that again, that's the song that I, uh, I, I took and I used it as the theme music. And I currently own that record, if you can believe it. I mean, I just felt like that was a really special song. So I actually went on eBay and I bought the original 44 vinyl, you know, the 1944 vinyl uh, record, including the Woody Herman version. And, uh, and, and that's just another ode to how much I love old music. And I actually have an autographed picture of Kay Kaiser, who some of you have seen before, it is, if you don't know Kay Kaiser yet, if you're familiar with Fallout New Vegas or I Got Spurs, that jingle, jangle, jingle, that's him. I He has a lot of movies. It, there's just so much you can dive in on with these artists you just hear in the background or featured in a video game that you may remember. Uh, and I highly advise it too. There's just so much you can discover and figure out about these people. So 
um, you know, that's that's just another tip if you're interested in that sort of thing. You can go down a rabbit hole with this sort of stuff. So um, there, there's, and I even have Doris Day, Doris Day, the the singer and actress. Uh, I don't think she has any songs featured in Fallout, but she does in Mafia Two. She uh, has a personally signed autograph to me before she passed away. I believe this was a, a year a year or two ago. I think Doris Day passed away. Um, so that was really neat that I got my hands on that. And to all of the people, the voice actors, so Eric Huffman, and I also forgot to mention that um, after Amy Harris left, uh, I believe it was season one of the strip, episode six, I believe, that's when she left and I replaced her with Sharon Grunewald, who is the current bunny. And of course, uh, Eric Huffman continues to be Walter. I think... He may be the only voice actor who has stuck by since the very start of this. So since episode one, Walter has been voiced by the same guy. It's a very distinctive voice that can't really be replicated unless it's done by Eric Huffman. So, you know, shouts out to to the cast there. And um, same goes to... Carrie Schultons and Philip Sacramento and Joshua Belmonte and and all these people that have come and gone and of course the storyteller uh, every everybody who's who's helped and I mean uh, Dominique Delion she did a uh, cosplay of Bunny who is currently that is currently the cover art of this podcast so that is Dominique Delion she did a great job doing the Bunny cosplay Grace Mutton and Michael Yeakley everybody who ever contributed artwork even Amy Harris made one and uh yeah it's it's really just a passion project and it all stems from a bomb radio which was once radio wasteland and old world tunes and it's now permanently a bomb radio so yeah I really want to thank everybody who's involved in this and I continue to write these and one thing I forgot to leap in was just that this is not a really professional way I do this and I just sort of gone with a system that's worked for me. So it's actually really difficult to keep episodes consistent, as consistent as I want them to be. I wish I could release one every day for you guys, but the process of writing it and thinking about it is kind of lengthy. But then also getting the recordings in, that is never a set in stone procedure. It's sometimes like when the actor can do it, the actor can do it. And that's when we get it. And there's not really much we can do because... I don't pay people really to do this. <laughs> this is really just like a free fan nonprofit effort as much as that means because it's really just a an amateur get together that we constantly improve as time goes by. So that is why um, there aren't like a thousand. If there were if there was a budget to fund like professional everything from across the board, I do it, but I don't, it's really expensive. I've looked into it. And also that doesn't just go for, uh, actors that goes for editors, uh, sound effects, mixing people, those costs a lot of money. So I've luckily found people who want to just volunteer and contribute to help build up their portfolio. So those people are usually the ones that currently edit the shows. And sometimes they can drop out out of nowhere because their schedule gets busy. Or the same could happen for an artist who I'm waiting on. And that will hold back the entire show. It's like a constant hand-in-hand effort. And if someone's not in the in the chain link, then the whole thing gets stopped. And we have to wait for someone to fill that spot again. So that's why there aren't like 2,000 episodes out now. Because I can write like a storm, but sometimes it gets a little disheartening when there's just not enough reliability and I'm not trying to call out anybody. I'm just saying that's the system we're running it on now, which is factually just not stable if you're not really getting professionals on it. So that's, that's really the, the reason it's not just a a lot of episodes. There's a lot of episodes out. Yeah, but not like a lot of episodes. So uh, we're continuing to do what we do and putting this together. There's a lot of neat ideas in the future for, Walter and Bunny, and yeah, I just wanted y'all to know that there is someone alive behind this podcast, so thank you so much for listening if you made it this far, and um, if I can make an excuse or an idea to release another one of these bonus episodes, then I will absolutely do it. If you want to contribute, uh, I do have a Patreon, it's patreon.com slash abomradio, 
There is an online merchandise shop for A-Bomb Radios called the A-Bomb Shop on Teespring, so give that a look. At, that's brand new. And also, just the very least I could ask for out of all of this is to, wherever you're listening to this podcast, wherever you're listening to my other one, the Bioshock Midnight series, but if you're listening to this podcast, please rate it and give it a review. I would love for this series to get seen more. Uh, everybody behind it would, and we'd be absolutely thankful for that, so... Um, thank you for hearing the story, the inspiration, and the appreciation that created this show. So look forward for more episodes, and thanks a lot.